it's with that for it's come up. Meanwhile, I can share my screen. Minimize this. Like that. <clears throat> Bring up the chat. And... Okay. All right. Can you all see my screen? Um. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes, Professor. All right, awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's uh, take a look at the syllabus. All right, so let's see. Um, all right, so you're, you should be currently working on the note Node.js assignment. I moved it a couple of days later, so you have a couple more days to work on it. And um, the the intention of the Node.js assignment is to learn how to create RESTful applications, RESTful web endpoints. Oh my my camera's off. Why is my camera? Off? There we go. Um, yeah, so the, the, the intent of the Node.js is for us to be able to practice how to create RESTful endpoints, right? Uh, although we, we had done that already um, a couple of weeks ago when we were exploring RESTful web APIs, but we did that using Java. And so we are revisiting the topic and learning how to do similar, similar things, similar features, but using Node.js. Equally, after, after we learn how to do RESTful APIs, we learn how to connect those APIs to data sources uh, through JPA and ORM and, and connect it to a relational database, uh, MySQL. So, so this week, we're going to somewhat replicate that. But instead of using relational databases, we'll, we're going to explore using non-relational databases, of which We'll play around with MongoDB uh, as you know one of the more popular non-relational solutions. Uh, so, so this this uh, these two these two weeks or these two topics somewhat mirror the same kinds of um, skills that uh, we learned we learned a couple weeks ago, but using this uh, alternative uh, stack. Okay. And you know it doesn't you know it's not like you have to use one or the other. Uh, you know pretty much what you can do with one you can do with the other, uh, and you can mix and match, right? You can have Java talking to Mongo, right, or Node.js talking to MySQL, right. And um, same thing in the front end, right? We, we've explored React.js, uh, but you know something cool to explore would be to use entirely different uh, front end. Right, where you could it could be Angular or it could be Vue.js or or any number of uh, front ends that uh, that would know how to talk um, AJAX or HTTP to retrieve data from a RESTful API. Uh, so you can mix and match all these different uh, um, tiers, right? Where where you know as long as they are aware of the interface. Uh, they can very well interact with one another uh, as long as they know how to talk JSON, as long as they, uh, as they can you know, put, get, post, delete uh, to a RESTful API. They can, you can put whatever you want in the front end. And, uh, and as long as they can connect, you know, have a connection to a, um, to a uh, connection string uh, to a database, they can pretty much talk to any database you want. So, so you can you can certainly mix and match, and, and that's uh, that's the beauty of uh, you know middle um, multi-tier uh, you know full stack developments. 
that uh, you you have hands everywhere, right? And you fully control the entire stack. That's uh, and that's a great skill to have uh, under your belt. Um, so yeah, so yeah, so we're gonna spend the next week or so uh, talking about MongoDB and uh, non-relational database in general, but specifically MongoDB. Uh, this is probably gonna take us. Uh, put us into next week as well. Um, and uh, so yeah, I, I had a buffer, kind of this buffer week uh, that I label as project, uh, which actually comes in very conveniently since um, Monday, next Monday, I believe it's a, it's a care day. We're not going to have a lecture. Uh, ne nevertheless, um, you're... you're um, uh, so that's the only thing that's not going to happen on Monday. We're, gonna, we're not going to have a lecture, but you know, I'll, I'll probably run a um, uh, an office hour uh, so that um, you know I'll make myself available. If you have any questions about projects or, or assignments, I'll be available that day. Um, and also, the the I believe the assignment is is due that day. Okay. Um, all right, uh, that's that's uh, that's where we've been and where we're going. Any any questions? I have two short and unrelated ones. Um, the first one is just uh, I noticed that the last two videos were not posted on the YouTube playlist. I think they were posted, but they're not in the playlist. Um, oh, they're not in the playlist. So I, I'm I'm just saying it in case people are following. Playlist, yeah, I yeah. think they're in the channel, but not inside the playlist. Yeah, they sh hmm, okay. Yeah, there's a, like an auto add feature. I guess they weren't added. Uh, they weren't auto added. <laughs> I'll check to see why they were not added. Yeah, thank I'm you. just mentioning it in case people are looking for it. No, no, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, and the second one is, is a non-relational database the same as a no SQL database? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yeah, we'll be talking about that um, today. Yes. All right. Uh, let's uh, let's get started then. Let's see. Uh, okay. Okay. So let's uh, let's talk about uh, MongoDB specifically, but in general non-relational database in, in, in general, but then MongoDB specifically. Uh, yeah, so you know, SQL databases or relational databases have been around for quite a while and they still will be, and they, uh, they are fairly dominant in the industry. Uh, and, and, but they do predate a lot of the more modern ideas such as object-oriented programming uh, and component technology and aspect-oriented programming. I mean, many of the new and you know, bleeding edge ideas are just not available in, in relational databases. And, uh, and, you know, and a lot of what we've been doing is um, you know, finding ways of how to adapt new ideas to you know, some of the legacy stuff that uh, are still lingers on in, in relational databases. And, and so more modern databases have been coming up, uh, dealing with some of the more uh, newer problems that, um, that relational databases perhaps are not well suited for. So relational database, just a little history on relational databases. Uh, they, um, you know, the, it's, a, it's a way of thinking about the data structure that you are storing for long-term storage, storage, right, where uh, the structure of the data is very well defined, and um, and you look to split uh, your data set into multiple tables uh, that are somewhat related to each other, right, where records on one table are related to other records in another another table, and that's where that's where the name relational. Uh, databases comes in, right? Where you have foreign keys on one table referring to primary keys in another table, right? And basically it's just saying that the, the um, if I want to relate to records, then I will make one field in one of the records have the same value as the uh, value in another field. 
in some other table. And logically, I, I, I say, well, if they are the same, then, then, then those two records are related to one another. And, and then databases uh, is just enforce certain constraints that um, if those two fields, not only are the, the, the values are the same, but if I logically say that that's, what, that's what's supposed to be, that that is the semantic of the meaning of these fields being equal to each other, then the database can enforce certain things. Uh, for instance, one of the things that it enforces is that uh, if I give a value to this, um, to this field uh, that, that uh, does not exist in the other table, then that's invalid, right? If, uh, if, that, if, 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 the, if the meaning is that if a foreign key is, is pointing to a primary key, it would make no sense for me to put a value in this field of a record that doesn't exist. It's like it's like putting a um, in uh, you know in C in C or C plus um, plus, you know, making a pointer, uh, assigning to a pointer a the value of a memory space that contains nothing or doesn't exist. And then if you try to dereference it, you would get a you know core dump or some, something something went wrong, right? So same thing here. The database doesn't allow you to um, make these uh, val uh, setting these values. Also, if you have relationships between two records and a if, if a record is pointing to another record, then you cannot remove the other the parent record, the, the one the primary key. If you try to remove it, the database will stop you and say, "Ah, you can't do that because you have all these folks are pointing to you. If I let you remove it, then I would leave all these folks." Uh, orphaned. So, so anyway, so the relational databases enforces all these ideas, uh, and um, and it has uh, all sorts of techniques on how to organize your data. Uh, and you know, we say that we try to normalize the data, making sure that we you know, we don't have huge tables uh, that have a lot of data that could be redundant. Instead, of we split it up and making sure to. A, minimize or remove uh, the redundancy because redundancy breeds inconsistency and so on and so forth. Right? So there's a whole course that folks teach on relational databases. Uh, so, so yeah, so th those, and those databases work very well when you have very well-structured data, right? You know the structure of the data and you can break it up and, and do all your designs and whatnot. So more recently in the last decade or two, perhaps, um, we, you know, we have seen an explosion in generating data, you know, from the advent of the of the internet and the and the World Wide Web. You know, folks are you know, folks are are generating just a, just a humongous amount of data every time we pick up a phone and we you know, jiggle it around. That generates a stream of data that somebody's storing somewhere, and they're trying to relate it to other pieces of data. Right? And they're trying to analyze this this the data that is amorphous. It has no no structure, and we're trying to identify what the structure of the data is uh, by using all sorts of um, you know artificial intelligence algorithms and data mining that is is going through through uh, this humongous amounts of pile of information, and then they're trying to make a sense out of it, trying to you know, target a, uh, a an advertisement, <laughs> uh, trying to sell me something, right? And um, and so so this 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 problem, you know, it has come to be referred to as um, uh, the um, uh, oh my goodness, um, what's it called? <laughs> it's a huge amounts of data, right? And uh, and and so the types of databases that uh, that can deal with these kinds of information. A lot of the information is uh, is geographical, right? Uh, that is, uh, you know, if you do if you search or if you uh, retrieve something, uh, it will be based on on where you are um, geographically. The information that that uh, and 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 if you if you move and go halfway across the world, then you'll get different different uh, results or, or different things that are targeted for a particular geography. And a lot of this information needs to be uh, reconciled uh, with uh, with, with uh, one another, uh, and it's very distributed. It's very redundant, 
uh, that uh, it can it can survive um, you know attacks or 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 failures uh, and and so th th there's a, there's new new requirements from uh, from uh, for for da databases that uh, you know relational databases just just doesn't cut it and so these these new breed of uh, databases that uh, are are creeping up like you know, MongoDB, Cassandra, CouchDB, Redis, Firebase, Dynamo, you know, they're, they're kind of tackling these, these, these new, uh, these new challenges. And, uh, and they're, you know, they, they don't use SQL, you know, structured query languages as the mechanism of interaction, right? They, they, obviously they, they have um, ways to implement the, the four or five common operations, which is, you know, I want to be able to create data. I want to be able to retrieve the data. I want to be able to update the data. I want to be able to delete the data. So they all do this, right? They all have to provide a mechanism to be able to crud the data. But you know, the main way that you interact with them is not SQL, right? So, so they have been, um, you know, they they fall into this umbrella of uh, of databases that are the no SQL databases, right? Uh, or the non-relational databases, and and of which we, you know, we are going to be uh, spending some time talking about one specific database, right? Which is the uh, Mongo MongoDB database. Okay, uh, but I, I do I do encourage you to explore these other uh, databases, you know, Cassandra, CouchDB, Firebase, right? Uh, definitely encourage you to take a look at those. Uh, so. So yeah, so we're going to be using MongoDB. You'll need to download MongoDB. Right, here's a, uh, a URL that you can uh, you can use to download it. And let's see if you if you go. Uh, I guess we can do this. We can say um, Mongo download community. There we go. Yeah. So this uh, this URL you can uh, you can download. Uh, MongoDB community server. Uh, you can select your operating system and download it. Uh, you know, for Mac OS, for for uh, for Windows, and now for Mac OS, you can um, you can copy it or move the zip file and unzip it. And now the the the, the common place to put it in in um, in on a Mac is is, is slash user slash local. Which I did. It's uh, it's right here. It's MongoDB Mac. I have, actually I have two two versions of it. Uh, and um, so for instance, in um, and under there, right? On, you know, when you unzip it, there's a bin directory, and that bin directory is going to have, I think, two or three executables, right? It'll have at least these two, Mongo and MongoD. Now these these two play the same roles in that uh, MySQL D and MySQL play in in the relational database MySQL, where one of them is the server. It's um, the one who's actually responsible for storing the data and for actually you know doing most of the work, well all of the work uh, for the database, you know, storing, retrieving, running your queries, and everything, right? So that's 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 MySQL D for MySQL. And in, Mon in Mongo, it's Mongo D, D for daemon, right? That presumably it's running as a service in the background, uh, listening for incoming connections, and and then you you uh, you interact with it through some kind of, kind of client. Now the, the client in Mongo DB is it's this one, Mongo, just plain old Mongo. And uh, so we're going to be focusing on these two tools. Now there's a whole bunch of other tools that you might be interested in, but we're not going to need uh, for our course, uh, that, which I have installed also under here. Right? Those those tools can be downloaded as well under if you go to tools here, uh, and if you go to database tools, you can download them from here. And what I did is I unzipped the content and I put it under the same bin directory. Uh, and then, and then that bin directory needs to be added to your path. You know, and once you add it to your path, you can run all these tools from the command line. Okay, and so, so yeah, the uh, for for if you're using Windows, right? Instead of putting it under user local, uh, what I did from Windows is I put it, I unzipped this folder, 
I unzipped um, I unzipped this this uh, directory under program files. Okay, and under there, the same thing. There will be a bin directory, and that bin directory needs to be added uh, to your path using uh, system and var system environment variables. Okay. Uh, so once once that's done, and then you can access all the tools from your PowerShell or uh, or, or whatever you use for your terminal. Um, yeah, so once you have that, you can start using it. And um, so let's let's go over some of the common things that um, you need to be able to do. So one, one of the things is that Mongo needs a directory where to store all its data. Okay, and so so the default place, the default place for Mongo to store all its data is under a directory called data and then data db right and and uh off of off of the root of your operating system of your file system right so so for instance if i if i try to run mongod and if i run mongod all by itself uh if i try to run mongod notice that it, it, it kicks me out to the terminal see that and and that's because it could not find slash data slash db. I think at the top you'll see the error at some point. Um, it's looking for there we go. So so it's listening. It's, it's trying to find slash data slash db and it won't find it uh, because I never created it. And and I want to de just demonstrate that it'll fail and it'll kick you back into the console. Uh, so. Now the reason I didn't do that is that uh, you know I've had a if 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 this were an industrial implementation maybe I would have done it this way uh, or uh, but because because this is a you know my own personal machine uh, and also this is an academic setting uh, we're not going to do this also uh, you know, folks have such a hard time <laughs> dealing with um, the the root. Uh, if you know how to do it and and uh, and your data and your operating system allows you, then that's fine. Go ahead and create the uh, the directory. Uh, you might need uh, administration privileges. Uh, if you're on a Mac, uh, I think you need even more than that. Uh, if you're in Big Sur or if you're in a Catalina, uh, the the operating system doesn't really like you, you know, mocking with the uh, with the root folder. The root directory. So, so if you know how to do it, then that's fine. It, it, go ahead. But if uh, if it if you if it, if it doesn't let you, if it doesn't let you, that's totally fine. We're going to create our own directory. We're going to create our own directory where we're going to put all our, our our database. Okay. So where are we going to put the data for our database? So what we're going to do is that I'm going to clone down the node project for this section. I think this is one it, right? SP2102, Genuzi server node. Okay. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to clone this project. Let's see. Uh, let's go to web dev and let's go to 20, 2021 spring uh, section two. And I'm going to do git clone my Node.js. There we go. And let's go into a server node. There we go. Okay. All right. So this is the this is the Node application that we've been playing around with for for a week or so. So we're going to create a directory in here where we're going to put the data for our Mongo database, right? So I'm going to say make directory data. Uh, and now we're going to restart MongoD. Let's restart MongoD. But this time we're going to say that the path that they should use, that it should use, is this data directory I just created. Okay. Uh, so so if we do that. It's going to it's going to start up. Notice that this time around it did not kick me back into the command line. That means that this is running successfully, right? And it's listening. Notice it says at port twenty seven thousand seventeen. Right, uh, and if that's if that's the case, then you have successfully uh, started 
start at uh, Mongo. Okay. All right. Now we're going to leave this running in the background. We're going to leave it alone and and in a different tab or in a different window. Okay, in another terminal window, console window. We're going to start the the client. Right? The client is going to connect to the to the server that we have it running locally. So we say Mongo. It right, starts up and it connects to our 27,017 uh, port by connecting to our database. If it was not successful, so you notice that it, it connected to localhost 2717, right? And it's running. And notice that it's giving me a, a prompt. That's the prompt that the client gives us. So we know we have successfully connected to the to, to Mongo. Otherwise, it would have kicked us out. Right, uh, and you would have seen back. You would have come back to the command line, right? But let's start it again, Mongo. There we go. We're connected. Everybody good? Now, so you can install Mongo to run as a service, so that it's always running. So that if you shut off your machine and you bring it back on, it's again it's running. And I mean that's fine if you're going to be using Mongo consistently you know, for months at a time, you know, for your regular development. Uh, but, you know, because we're going to be just using it for, you know, for, for you know, at most a couple weeks, right? So then, then I, I, you know, I'm showing you how to start the server brand new and then connect to it. So every time you try to, you need to work with it, you'll need to restart your server in that directory, right? Where that data directory is, okay? Otherwise it won't work. Um, but again, if you're going to, if you're going to be using it, you know, for long periods of time and, and it's your main database, then yes, I would consider running it as a service. So it's always running. Okay. So we're connected. So let's play around with the, with the, uh, database and, and learn a little bit. What can we do with it? Okay. All right. So, so some of the command lines, the commands that we want to learn about is first of all, you know, I want to list what databases I have so far and maybe create a new one where I can do all my work. Okay, so one of the things that, one of the commands that we need to learn is, you know, show me the databases, DB, show DBs. And right now it's just showing the default databases, you know, admin, config, local. Those, those come out of, the, out of the box when you first install Mongo. And we're, gonna do, we're not going to do anything with those. We're going to leave them alone. Instead, we're going to create our own database Right, where we're going to store all our data. So to create a new database, we use the command use and then the database that we want. Right. And and so since we've been creating a um, a whiteboard application, I'm gonna call the database whiteboard. So white board. And since this is section two, I'm gonna say dash o2. Okay. Uh, notice that if I run uh, show dbs again. Notice that even though I, it says that it's successfully switched, it doesn't actually show the database, right? It doesn't show it. Not until we actually store data will it actually show that the database has been created, okay? But nevertheless, we are in the correct database, whiteboard 02. So to start inserting uh, data, we, we have to learn about a few commands, right? So all commands, uh, well, for, for, first of all, uh, we, we, we want to insert data, right? We want to insert data, retrieve data, delete data, update data. So in a, in a relational database, the, the way we store data, we say that we store it inside of tables, right? And, and then each table uh, then contains uh, a whole bunch of rows. Right, where each row is a record. And, and then you know, some of those records might be related to one another with foreign key, primary key, blah, blah, blah. So here the the it's the same concept, but we use different terminology. Right. So for instance, so instead of a table, uh, we say that uh, these are collections. Okay. And so so that instead of tables containing rows. Here we say that is collections containing 
documents. Okay, it's different terminology, right? But it's, it's the same thing, right? A um, a table is a collection of rows, right? Um, well, the reason we don't call it tables here because ta tables give the connotation of like columns, right? And so we definitely don't have columns here, right? Instead, what we have is objects, objects in the little sense that uh, you have property values, property values, property values. Sometimes we say they're key value pairs, key value, key value, key value. And, um, and a key is almost like a column and a value, it's almost like a cell instead of a row, okay? But you know the analogy breaks down when you start thinking that a key or a property can have as a value, it could have another object that contains a whole bunch of keys, a whole bunch of values. And those, those objects or those properties can, can contain again, other sub objects. So it can be fairly nested. Right. And so we don't have that at all in the in the tables. If you have a cell in a table, right, a data cell, it can only contain primitive data types. You know, it can contain a date, it can contain a um, a string, an integer, a float. Right. It it could contain a, an entirely binary data, right? But we don't we don't have a like a record containing sub records, right? If you want a sub record. The only way that you could do that is to reference another record in another table. Well, that's it, right? You can, you can say, well, it's not embedded. I'm referencing it here. Literally, you can contain objects within objects within objects within arrays of objects of arrays of arrays of objects of objects. So you can have arbitrarily complex right, objects that contain other objects. So that's why we don't call them records. Right? We call them like an entire document like a JSON document, like in uh, like a JavaScript um, object notation document. So that's another, that's another uh, factor here is that the data that we're gonna be storing in these collections, right? Are formatted as JSON strings, right? So curly brackets, right? Name value pair with commas and colons and arrays and whatnot. So JSON objects that we've been using throughout the uh, semester. Okay, so yeah, same same concepts, but you know, implemented differently, different jargon, different terminology. Okay. Uh, all right. So yeah, so a database basically has a whole bunch of collections, just like a database in relational databases has a bunch of tables. Here, a database has a whole bunch of collections. Okay, and just like in uh, relational databases, a table contains a whole bunch of rows or records. Here, a collection contains a whole bunch of documents, okay? So one of the first things that we need to know is, is you know, now that we are working in a particular database, we need to be able to list what collections do we have, right? So we can say show collections. Now it's empty because obviously we haven't yet put anything in there, right? We are in that database, it's a, very, it's a brand new database. We haven't created any new collections, okay? All right, so, so it doesn't show the database. It doesn't show the collection. Let's start adding something, right? So let's start adding a, use, a, a user record, right? So all commands have the following syntax, right? They all start with DB. They all start with, with the DB dot, DB dot. Then the collection where you want to store your data. Right. In this case, this says I want to store my data in a collection called users. Right. Notice, notice the naming convention. Right. It's a plural noun, users, right. quizzes, questions, right. And it's all lowercase. Um, although it can be camel case, since um, Mongo, unlike MySQL. So Mongo is case sensitive, whereas MySQL was case insensitive. So in, in MySQL, you would find that if you had compound words, right, um, then the way you would name those, those, uh, those symbols in MySQL is that you would use underscores, right? So 
uh, you know, quiz attempts would be quiz space underscore attempts. Whereas here in, in Mongo, you could you can say you know quiz attempts where and you capitalize the A. Okay. Uh, so yeah, you could use camel casing for the names of your uh, collections. Yeah. So once you specify the collection, then then you can specify what do you want to do with that collection. And here's where you know the common operators come in, right? You can basically do four things, right? You can you can create data, you can retrieve data, you can update data, or you can delete, remove data, right? Those are the four basic CROD operations, right? Everything else is a der derivation of these four basic operations, right? So to create data, you know, like, like in relational database, we insert data into the table. Here, we insert data into the collection. So we say insert, okay? We say db.users.insert. And then, and then notice that it, the syntax is that it looks like a function. See that a function, notice that there's dots, right? So it's very object-oriented syntax, right? So objects, dot notations and whatnot. And then these are functions that take as argument depending on what it is that you're doing. So if it's an insert, this takes the data that you wanna insert into the users, right? And the data, as I mentioned earlier, is formatted as a JSON literal string, okay? So meaning it starts off with curly brackets and then inside you have name value pairs, right? Or key value pairs. So let's, let's create a couple of things. Let's create a couple of users. We'll say, you know, first, so that's the key. And then the value could be, you know, Alice. And then last could be Wonderland. Okay, uh, maybe username, Alice. And let's do an insert. No, there it is. So it responds saying the insert was successful. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a JSON object just with name value pairs. Let's insert another one. Let's uh, insert maybe Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace was the first programmer, right, Ada Lovelace. And we do insert, okay, there it is. So we have two records, sorry, not records. We don't call them records here. We call them documents. All right, let's insert one more. Now, now to point out the fact that this data is unstructured. Okay, let me show you here. If we say first, and then we say first name, and this might be Bob, and this might be last name, and this would be Hope, and then the username might be just Bob. Okay. Uh, you know, some of you might cringe at this and say, wait, wait a minute. Uh, some of the fields you call them first, and then this one you call them first name. How come the database is not balking at this and says, what, the database let you do that? Well, again, so the, the, um, so the focus of these databases is that they deal very well with unstructured data, right? So they don't enforce any structure into the data. It is it is your responsibility to make sure that what you're putting in here has the structure that you want, right? So you would not deliberately do this, uh, even though the database allows you to do this, okay? Uh, it is your responsibility, not the database responsibility to make sure that this data is sound. Uh, again, because it, it wants to give you the, the freedom of you know, putting any objects in there um, because data could be unstructured. You want to be, you can, be, you you should be able to have the freedom of adding new fields, removing fields, maybe changing the data type. Unlike SQL, where its 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 focus is very very much on structured data, data that has a very well defined structure, right? And it's if, if it's going to change over time, it'll change very very slowly. Whereas here, 
you can literally go from one document to the next and they could be entirely two different documents. The schema might be completely different. So this is not something you would actually do, uh, but I just wanted to point out that you are allowed, there is no such thing as a schema. You know, your documents are not being validated against any particular schema. Um, all right, so we've inserted three records. Let's um, uh, let, let's insert one more, and this one will be maybe Tim Burns Lee, and the uh, username might be T Lee. Okay, we've inserted four four records. Now we can retrieve these records as follows. You can say db.users again, right? All the commands start off with you telling me what collection are you interacting with? So we're interacting with the users collection. And then again, one of the four operators, right? I wanna be able to create. So we did just, we, need, we, we can insert. Uh, we can retrieve data uh, by using the, the, the function find. So find is equivalent to select star from in MySQL, right? Where you can retrieve data from a collection. And, and notice that it's, a, again, it's a function and uh, it takes arguments to configure that find. If you don't say anything, right? If you don't pass any arguments, then the interpretation is that you are retrieving all the records, sorry, the documents. You're retrieving all the documents from the user's collection, right? And there they are. We have four documents in the user's collection. And you can see that you, you, you have the data that you had inserted, right? For the first, Alice, Ada, Bob, and Tim, okay? But there's something else that we didn't add, right? It's this thing that it's something about an ID, an object ID, what the heck, what is that? So, so these, these identifiers right, are just that. They uniquely identify this record. They guarantee that you have at least one field which is different from, the value of that field is different from any other document in that collection, okay? Um, the, uh, the name, the note knows the name starts with underscore. And, and usually that's an indication that this field is a special field that is has a special meaning for the database, right? If you have an underscore or something like that, right? This is a managed field by Mongo, right? And ideally you would stay away from it, right? You, you don't deal with it, right? You can override this and, and say, I wanna use my own IDs, notice that the default behavior is that Mongo will create these values for you out of the box. If you don't say anything, it'll create, every time you insert a new document, it will create a unique identifier for you. And the data type is that it's an object ID, okay? Uh, you can override it. And I believe in the assignment, I do ask you to override this to be a string and that you will be using your own values uh, only to make it easier for the TAs to grade you so that they, they don't have to come up with IDs and find out what IDs to use. Uh, I We give you all the IDs. Uh, so yeah, so it creates these IDs for you. They are unique. Uh, they're also indexed, right? So that um, it makes it easy and fast for you to retrieve these documents if you know the ID of a document. Also, they're hard to read, right? Because, you know, it's, it's a, you have these wrapping and, and it's hard to read. So it's hard to parse. So, so what we could do is we can um, stream the, uh, the results that comes back from the find. We can stream it to a layout transformation uh, function, right? That makes the content look a little more prettier, right? And that is called pretty. So pretty is gonna take the result of that find, right? And it's gonna format it so that it's a little bit easier to read uh, for our eyes, okay? Adding some new lines, tabs, some white spacing, right? To lay it out nicely. 
And then you can see the same field, same value, right? It's just formatted nicely, only for reading purposes, right? It leaves the actual data intact, right? It's not actually doing anything, okay? All right, so let's continue. So we can find, uh, now here, if you do find and you don't provide any arguments, the default behavior is that it retrieves all the documents. Or you can be a little more specific and say, you can provide two arguments. Let's look at the first argument of find. So the first argument of find is a JSON object that specifies the predicate by which you want to retrieve uh, the data. If you don't provide any any um, if you don't provide any content in there, then it interprets that as being oh, I have no predicates. That means I will retrieve every single document in the in the collection. Right. Instead, if you specify here you can, a, a pattern, it'll try to pattern match, right? Whatever you put in there. Right? For instance, you can say um, I want the document whose first name right, is Alice. Right? So it will iterate over your documents to find the records that match that criteria. Right? If we do that, notice that it comes back with one record, which is Alice. That's the only one that matched. Make sense? Uh, you can also retrieve by by primary key, so which is a very common operation. If you know an object's primary key, uh, you can use that instead. Right, so we pass that in. It has to have the object ID data type. Right? You can't just use the string. Right? If we do enter, there is you get the same uh, document. Make sense? Uh, all right, excellent. Uh, let's see. See the slides if I forgot something. Server, Mongo client, Mongo connect to a database from the command line. Show the database. Okay, now that we have inserted something in the database, you can try the collections again. Show collections. Notice that this time, oh, S, connections. Notice that this time it does come back with a value of users. All right, so we have successfully inserted something in users. Notice that also show DBs. Now that we have inserted something in the database, right now it does show that we do have a whiteboard uh, database. Okay. All right. Excellent. So, so let's play around with this database. So we're going to be playing around with the following data model. Right. This uh, data model is complex enough that it has a little bit of everything. It's got inheritance. It's got one-to-many relationship. Uh, in this case, it's an aggregation relationship. This has a many-to-many -many relationship. Okay. So it's got a little bit of everything that we can play around with. So first, we create the database. Here's the collection and the commands for inserting. Uh, we can show the collections. We can find by primary key, we can printify, did that. We can find by an object ID, uh, or by a non-key. Oh yeah, let's talk about this. So there it is. So we, we have um, retrieved data of Alice, there it is. Um, so, so as I said earlier, right, the find command has two arguments of which the first one is the, what it's called the selector, okay? Um, and, and where you specify what records you want. The second argument specifies what field, no, notice that when we retrieve something, it always comes back with all the fields, okay? So the second argument allows you to filter and choose and configure which fields do you want. By default, you get all the fields. You can say that, that you, you don't want a particular field. You can say, I, you know, last name, last name, I don't want it. Okay. Uh, so if you do enter, notice that now you get all the fields except the last, the last name. See that? Right? Uh, so zero says filter it out. I don't want it. If instead it's one, it means that I want that field, right? 
and no other field, right? That's the only field that I want. And you can list a whole bunch of ones that you do want, right? So for instance, you can say, I want the last one, okay? And notice that indeed we see the last, um, but we also see the ID, right? We also see the ID. Let's, let's come back to that in a minute. Um, you can also list that you want some other field. Maybe you want the username. But you can specifically say which ones you want, right? So last name and I want the username. So you can specify which one, which one you don't want with zeros and ones and blah, 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 right? But notice that you always get the ID, the underscore, even though you didn't say whether you wanted it or didn't want, right? Uh, so, so, yeah, um, so by default, you always get it. If you do not want it, you have to explicitly say you do not want it, right? So for instance, you can say, you know, comma, and then underscore ID, I don't want it, right? And then you only get what you want, last and username, okay? That in, 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 in database jargon is called projection. You're projecting, projecting the fields that you want. Okay, so let's take a let's take a look at this uh, data model, the sections here, right? And let's create a couple of sections. I think I have uh, some sections here we can use. Let's create this first one. And uh, if you read through it, it says I want to insert into the sections collection that doesn't exist. The name of the section is a one. Has twelve seats and it's it's related somehow to course CS one hundred and one. So let's copy that. Oops. Let's copy that and paste it here. Oops. Copy, paste. There we go. So we copied it and pasted it, and it was successful. It says that um, inserted one. Uh, name is zero one. Seats is twelve. Course is CS101. Notice the dot 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 here. It doesn't mean that this is a spreader function. It just means that there was a new line, right? And and then it continued uh, as if it were a single line. Okay. Let's insert a couple more. Let's insert this one. And let's insert this one over here. And finally, this one over here. Notice that the the difference between all these, right, is that obviously they have different names and they all, we have two of them belonging to course CS101 and we have two belonging to CS102, right? We have two different sections for the same course and two different sections for another course. And we also have different seats, 12, 23, 34, and 45. Okay, let's see, let's see how we can interact with this. So first of all, we, we, uh, we can say, let's retrieve all the sections for the course CS101. Okay, and notice that it comes back with two sections. There are two sections for that course. It lists the two documents that are related to CS101. Make sense? Uh, now you can filter out and say, well, I have those that those two, but I want the one whose seats right, is 12. And notice that indeed it comes back with that one document. Okay, so, so it basically it's pattern matching, looking, you know, iterating over all those documents, seeing where those, which documents match the criteria that I'm listing here. It's almost like an and, right, Boolean operator where you say, well, I want the one where courses is CS101 and I want the courses where the seats is 12. And then it comes back with the intersection of those two predicates. In this case, this one document matches the fact that the course is CS101 and that the seats is 12, okay? Uh, but this is kind of like an implicit and, right? We'll see in a minute, how would we do an explicit, explicitly wanting to an and or an or or more complex Boolean operators. We'll see in a minute. Uh, yeah, we did that. Now there are quite a bit of um, uh, operators, okay, such as greater than, less than, equal, not equal, nor, 
not, okay, that allow you to build, you know, fairly complex Boolean expressions so that you can filter exactly which documents you want. All right. So for instance, this one says, you know, retrieve for me the sections whose seats is greater than 30. Okay, and that, that's it. So this returns these two sections. Let's take a look at the syntax for a second, right? So basically the first part of the syntax is what field in the document are you comparing? So we're comparing these seats, right? These seats uh, fields in the document. And what is the predicate? Well, I want the ones that are greater than 30. And notice that again, it follows JSON notation, right? Where you have key, then colon value, where that value is another expression, right? That says that it has to be greater colon than 30. Make sense? Uh, notice that our command starts with a dollar sign, meaning this is not a literal string. It's not a property, it's not a key, it's not a value. Instead, it's an operation, right? It's a, it's a Mongo operation, you know, they all start with a dollar sign. And there's a whole bunch of them. There's greater than, there's less than, equal, not equal, nor, not. Okay, we'll see that in a minute. Uh, so here's the example of, of a little and, right? Right, again, this is one of the many operators you have, and, or, not. Uh, and notice that it starts off, here's the opening curly bracket, right? This is the property colon. Right, and then the value is an array of predicates. Okay, where each predicate is a JSON object, where the first property is the name of the field that you're comparing, and then the value is the operation that you want it to be greater than or equal to or less than or whatever than some little value. Okay, so if we run that. Uh, it comes back with that one section that whose seats is greater than 30, but it's less than 40, which is 34, right? It's right in between those two boundaries, okay? Um, all right, uh, some other operations, you can sort the content. So if we retrieve the, um, if we retrieve the sections, if we retrieve the sections, all by themselves. Uh, there they are, all the sections. Notice that by default, right, because they were inserted in this order, you have them increasing in seats. But you can sort that backwards. Well, actually forwards first. Right, this is sorted by seats ascending. Or you can say minus one, so you can have them descending. See that, 45, 34, 23, 12, see that? Um, yeah, and you can, you can splice these together, right? One of them can do the sort, another one can do a pretty, right? And, and then you can put them all together. So this one is sort, and then you can pass that on to the next transformation, which makes it look a little prettier and you can make sense out of it, okay? Um, all right, excellent. So let's uh, keep going. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's a whole bunch of operators, right, that can be used in these selectors, right? You can do comparisons such as, you know, is something equal to something, right? Is uh, something greater than, something is less than, greater than or equal, right? Less than or equal, not equal in and not in, right, instead of an array. So there's, there's a few, few of them. Also with Boolean operators, uh, you have the usual suspects, right? You have obviously and, and you have or, but you also have not, right, and nor, right? Again, I, I encourage you to go through the documentation and just feel, become familiar with the existence of these. Let's see, is there, is there a question in the chat? And what if you want to find something that is on some, on more than one document? One, more than one document. 
I think we did that, right? Yeah, we 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 found a um, uh, we found two documents that belong to the same course. Yeah, we did that. Um, aggregation operators you can you can use count, group, limit, skip, right? Those are you know fairly fairly straightforward. They're equivalent to what you can do in a relational database. You won't be asked about aggregation operator. I just want you to know that it's there and you know, and encourage you to follow up in the documentation. <coughs> Excuse me. So, all right, so we've did we've done um, inserting data. We we did retrieval of data. How about updating data? Okay, so to update data, we're gonna use the command update. Okay, so let's take a look at it. So let's let's update maybe uh, this section two here. We're gonna say somebody enrolls in this uh, section, and so we need to decrement the number of seats that are available. So we would say something like db dot uh, users or seats or sections sorry sections that update. And so update takes two arguments, right? It takes the, the first argument says, you know, which documents you want to update, right? And it's, you know, this identifies, you know, which document are you talking about, right? So we are, we are talking about the section whose name is O2, okay? Uh, and, and then the second argument is, well, what do you want to do with it? So in our case, if somebody comes in and enrolls in this, the seats should become uh, one less than 23. So I'll say seats colon 23, uh, 22, one less than 23. Okay, so let's do that. All right, it says that yes, it was successfully updated. Let's look at the um, let's get the uh, look at the sections. Pretty. All right, let's see. Uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four sections, but something happened to section, this section, that's weird. Notice that they all have, you know, four fields, but this one has just one field or two, I guess. And, but indeed the seat seems to have gone down from 23 to 22. These stay the same, 12, 34 and 45, right? This went down from uh, 23 to 22. But what happened to all the other fields? Oh no, we lost all the other fields. And that's because we used a syntax here that is basically a replace, right? I want to replace the content of a document with this content. And that's not really what we want, right? What we do want is I want to update, let's say, let's say I want to update this one, 03. The correct way of doing it, okay, let's change this from 34 to 33, is that, is that um, this is what I want, right? I want it to be 33, right? But I need to be able to set the value, right, of that field as opposed to replace the entire object. So the correct syntax is to do the following. You say dollar sign, set, okay, now this is gonna work, right? It's going to, I want to modify the following field and I want it to have this new value. Okay, all right, let's take a look at it. Let's say, okay, it looks like it's succeeded. Let's take a, let's pretty print it. All right, it looks like indeed it did work, right? We were able to change the seats of the section whose name is three, and we were able to bring it down to 33 uh, like we intended, right? So that's the correct syntax to use, right? So, so now we have this bogus content right there that we should really get rid of it. Right? So for that, we have remove. We can say db.users.remove, where you can provide here a criteria by which you can remove content, right? We want to remove the one whose seats 
right, is 22. That's that, or we can use it by ID as well, right? So 22. Let's see. Look, uh, that didn't work. DB that uses dot remove seats 22. Remove. Why did that not work? Uh, did I put the colon curly brackets? Remove users. Oh, not users. Sorry. <laughs> Sections. Sections. There we go. Now let's list all the sections and notice that indeed the that bogus section went away. Okay. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's keep going. Now there's a whole bunch of other operations, right? Uh, but you know, basically this is the one that we care about. Actually, I think this is a copy of that one. Let's see, well, this is the one you really care about. Insert. All the other ones are just syntactic sugar of of these versions, right? And same thing for update. There are a couple of these, uh, but really the one we really care is this one right here, update. Uh, and th same thing for remove. There's a couple of different ones, variations, uh, of which really this one's the one we care about. All right, so let's talk about inheritance and, rel and generalizations. Now, so here's a here's something that is very common in object-oriented programming languages, where you have a kind of like a base class, right? That then several other classes are going to inherit from, right? They either extend, right, uh, and and then usually. They what happens is that they inherit all the behaviors and all the uh, data or properties that are declared in the parent class, uh, and then the 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 derived classes. I right, can then maybe add additional properties, additional behavior, additional uh, data of their own that is specific to their particular class. So they they inherit everything from a parent class and then they add their own, okay? So in relational databases and in non-relational non databases, this is a foreign uh, concept, okay? That, that, um, uh, that has no direct equivalence right, on how to implement this. So in, in, in relational databases, the one of the ways to implement this is to have one table, one tables per class. And then you know some information is stored in the parent class or the parent table. Uh, and some information is stored in the tables related to the subclasses, right? And then and then to recreate the data structure, you join the tables together. Okay. So yeah, so we don't we don't have that at all in non-relational databases, in particular MongoDB, there's no such thing either. And um, I mean, we could also have different collections like a user collection, a faculty collection, a student collection, right? And some of the fields will live here and there. So more commonly, right, we we use a what is called a denormalized strategy, right? So instead of instead of having multiple collections, one for faculty, one for student, one for users, right? An alternative solution is to add a field, right? That tells me what type of object this is, right? And, and then you can drive then the logic beyond that of, of, you know, if it is a faculty or it's a student, then then that means that additional fields apply, right? So for instance, if you're faculty, then you probably have an office, right? And if you're a student, you probably have a GPA, right? Or you have a scholarship, right? Or you have you know, something that only pertains to, student, to students, right? And not necessarily to faculty and vice versa. So you have 
all the fields that all users get, plus some fields that are specific to a specific role right, or subclass. Right? So for instance, here, right, here's Ada. We know she's a person, she's a user of the system, but beyond that, she's also a faculty. Right? And by the way, these are all the fields that are related to that new role. Okay, so let's let's play around with that. Let's uh let's look at let's look at Ada. So you know db dot users dot find pretty. So so yeah, here's Ada. Notice that nowhere does it show that she's a faculty. Well, we can we can fix that. We can say db dot users, and we want to change. We want to update. This user, and we'll say we'll use it by username. Okay. And so remember, update takes two arguments. The first one is the, uh, the predicate telling us which record are we updating. So we're updating that one. There's only one user whose username is Ada. And the second argument is what I want to change. Now I don't want to change anything right i don't want to change ada's first name last name or username god forbid you know change her id instead what we want to change is her role right i want to say that or type the type of user is that now she's a faculty okay and notice that this is not a change but it's like a merging or i'm adding a new field that was not there before right and uh, and if I do that, uh, and I've looked for all the users again, you'll notice that now, uh, oh, <laughs> I didn't say set. Er. <laughs> Let's do that with Alice. How's that? Let's do Alice. Alice. And we do set. We're gonna set the type to be faculty. Okay, let's take a look at the users. There we go. Notice that now Alice is indeed a faculty. Okay. And um, I can do some more updates. I can say that now, well, now that she's a faculty, uh, she gets an office. Right, and the office is 132A. There we go, faculty and then the office, perfect. Okay, so, so, so the update is not only updating fields that are already there and changing their values, it also means I wanna add a new field, okay, with a new value, it's pretty cool, right? So I can do the same thing with Bob. And so let's, um, let's change Bob to also to, to be a student, so this would be a student, and this is Bob. And let's change Tim Burns Lee to be a faculty as well. So faculty and T Lee. And not only is he a faculty, but he also has a, an office right next to Alice. So this would be 133. Oops. 132B. So now we can retrieve all the faculty. We can say dbusers.find the users whose type is faculty. There we go. We've got two, well, three faculty. One of them uh, used, well, was supposed to be Ada. Uh, or we can return all the students. And that's Bob. Perfect. Excellent. All right, um, yeah, so, so you, you can use this type, right, to decide to retrieve things, right, based on this field that allows you to discriminate one type of record versus another. Okay, so let's talk about many to many, right? So many to many, so many to many in a, um, in a relational database, right? The only way to implement many-to-many -many in a relational database is to have 
uh, a mapping table between two tables. All right, so if, we, if you have actors, right, and you have movies, then, you know, if one actor acted in a whole bunch of movies and vice versa, right? If you take one movie that for which many actors acted in that one movie, right? That's referred to as a many to many. And, and now in, in Java or in any programming language, usually the way you, you capture that, right? Is that you just have each one have an array of references to each other. So like, like in the actors class, you would have an array of movies that that actor has acted in, right? And vice versa, in the movies class, you could have an array of actors, the actors that are acting in that movie at that current time, right? And, and so, and that's it. That's all you would do in an object-oriented programming language, okay? Now, in a relational database, you can't do that because there's no arrays. Right. You, you don't have an arrays. You can't have a student having a field and that field be an array of foreign keys that point to a whole bunch of uh, sections that they enrolled in, right? Or the actor having a whole bunch of, you know, having a, mov a movies field and then with a whole bunch of movies that they refer to. There's no such thing. So the only way to go around and implementing that is to have a separate table that points to both of them. It says, okay, well, you know, here's where the actor to movie mapping is that I'm going to point to the actor and I'm going to point to the, to the movie. I'm going to say that this actor is acting in that movie or vice versa. If you start a point from the point of view of the movie, said, so, well, for this movie, all those actors are acting in this movie. And the way I do that is that I have a intermediate table that has all those records inserted for every every relationship between the movies and the actors right um in object orientation there's no need to have a separate class right to capture this each class could could you know refer to each other multiple times okay uh, well in in a, in non-relational databases like mongo you can do the same kind of thing that you can do in Java, okay? So, so for instance, now the, the classical way, the classical way of implementing many to many in a relational database is that you need an extra table, right? So for instance, say you, you have students and sections and the one student can be enrolled in many sections and one section can have many students enrolled in it, okay? If if the enrollment is the only thing we care about, then each one can contain an array. A student can contain an array of the sections that they're enrolled in, and the section can contain an array of students that are enrolled in that section, okay? Now, the classical way of implementing this in a database is to instead have a third table, and that third table has references to the sections, references to the, to the, to the students, saying that that student is enrolled in that section, okay? And just points to both, right? Those two are related, those two are related, those two are related, right? It's just pointing to all the related records. Okay, so classical implementation is as follows. You have, you have each, each uh, enrollment table has a reference to the section and a reference to the student that are related to one another and they, a reference to the pointing, pointing to the primary key of both records. But like object-oriented programming languages, like in Java, the way you can implement it is instead is to have an array, an array of pointers, right? To all the sections that a student is enrolled in. So for instance, student one can have a, an array of sections, right? That IDs, so that they know, oh, these are all the sections that I am enrolled in. And vice versa, right? From the section's point of view, the section can have a, an array of students that are enrolled in that section, okay? Now, graphically, this is what it will look like, right? And um, you know, this is the way that relational databases implemented, but right? this is the only way that relational databases could implement it.
You have an enrollment table in between, pointing to student and section saying who's enrolled in what. Okay. Um, now, in a in a non-relational database, even though they're not non-relational, you can implement the same thing that a relational database does. You can have a separate collection of which you are referencing both the section and the student that are related to one another. Okay. Now, the problem with this approach, I'm sorry, this is just fine, right? This is just fine. Now, the alternative, the alternative is to use arrays, right? Where student one, for instance, might have a reference, right? Inside of an array saying that student one is enrolled in section one and student two is also enrolled in section one, okay? And student three can, is enrolled in multiple sections at the same time. Okay, now the problem with this with this approach of using multiple multiple uh, values in both cases, looking from the student's point of view or from the section's point of view, is that you we are introducing um, redundancy in the system, right? And redundancy breeds inconsistency. Notice that these two students are saying that they belong to section one. Yes. And if we accept the fact that both need to be referencing each other, where student one points to section one and student two is also pointing to section one, then if you, if you look at it from the side of the section, well, you should be able to reconcile or have the same information in both places, right? For instance, from section one, it also should match the fact that these two students are enrolled in the section. It would make no sense if, if these two students say that they are in the same section, but then when you ask the section, you would only have maybe student one, but not student two. That would make no sense, right? That if I have student one, but not section two, that would make no sense. That, that would mean an inconsistency, right? There is an inconsistency in the data, right? That, why that depend you ask to two folks and they, they don't they don't agree and that makes no sense so that you know either looking at from the student towards the section or from the sections looking at the student you have to have the same information right and this introduces a a challenge right uh, so here's an example of how to implement it right let's see if we so if we look at the students and we have Bob Hope here. Here's Bob, right? Here's Bob. And let's see, let's look at Bob again, users.find, right? And then whose username is Bob. Okay, so what do we got? There, so we got Bob, pretty it up. It's pretty up Bob, there we go. Uh, and let's look, at, let's, let's look at the sections. So we have, uh, db dot sections dot find dot pretty okay we have those two sections so let's let's enroll uh, bob in section section one right let's do that so we'll say db dot users dot update we're gonna update with a uh, user is Bob. We are gonna say that I'm gonna set a brand new field called sections. Sections is gonna be an array of all the sections that Bob is enrolled in. So we're gonna put section one, right? So we're gonna put that ID of section one. There we go. Oops. Have double quotes here. There we go. I'm missing a single quote. There we go. Enter. Uh, I guess that didn't work. Users update user blah blah blah. Mm, no, what happened to Bob? Do I have user? Oh, it's username Bob. There we go. Okay, yeah. So I was able to create or update Bob. Let's take a look at Bob again. Find Bob. 
Okay, notice that Bob now says that he's enrolled in this section. But if I ask the stat section, if I ask the section, there's a section one, doesn't know anything about Bob. So right now the database is in an inconsistent state, right? If we say that this is many to many, that users are pointing to the sections and the sections should be able to tell me what the students are, which is very common, right? You as a student wanna be able to retrieve and say, oh, what are the courses I'm enrolled in? And Canvas should tell you the courses that you're enrolled in. But from a faculty's point of view, if I'm looking at a section that I'm teaching, I like to be able to know what are the students enrolled in the section. So definitely there's a many to many. Uh, you can see it from the students, you can see all the sections, and from the sections, you can see all the students, right? So definitely many to many. And so right now the database is inconsistent. You're, if you ask Bob, he's enrolled in section one. But if you ask section one, nobody's enrolled in section one, right? So to, to reconciliate this, you have to say, right, you have to update also section one, right? You have to say, you know, db.sections.update. And there's two of these. So the update, the section one here, um, we're gonna say that uh, we're gonna do a set. You can say that this is students and we need to put in Bob here. So Bob, it's this one, we'll put this ID right there. Right, so now if I ask the sections, indeed section one also concurs that Bob is enrolled in that section. So that's, that's a problem, right, because what if I mistakenly, like I just did, forget to enroll, to update the sections, right? So, so by and large, right, we try to avoid having to do something like this manual, like I just did. Instead, we use APIs or programs, right, that can guarantee the fact that it will update both sections or shortly after, or at least inside of a transaction, right, so that Right. If one fails, the other one also fails. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, we'll do one to one, one to many when we come back. Uh, yeah, we're gonna leave it here. Any any questions? All right, then, folks. That's uh, that's all I have for you. Oh, one question regarding the, we, we need to do the check-in with the TAs this week, I believe. Is it just a matter of going to their office hours or is that the way? No, the, the TAs are supposed to, the, the TAs are supposed to publish uh, time slots that they're available for doing the demos. Um, apparently they haven't done that yet. They, they're, they're supposed to be able to, you're supposed to be able to register with them at a specific time that they are available and then demo your project. Apparently that hasn't happened yet, but. Okay, so should we just so keep an eye out for Piazza? Okay, thank you. Yes. Uh, professor, what's the workbench equivalent in uh, Mongo? I'm sorry? Uh, like how What's the workbench equivalent uh, in Mongo, uh, MongoDB? Oh yeah, Ma Mongo has a, uh, I think it's called Compass. Okay. Mongo, Mongo Compass, I think it's called Compass. Yeah, this is the, this is a um, UI that allows okay. you to, to interact. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so Professor, we will learn how to manipulate um, between a server and database like MongoDB next time, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll start using Mongoose. Mongoose is the, so that we can talk to the database programmatically as opposed to manually like we're doing now. Okay, thank you. Yep. Is there any specific requirement for our group project to 
selects the database. You can use whatever database you want. So okay. yeah, for the for the assignments, you have to use specifically, you know, these servers, these UI libraries, these databases. For the project, you're it's open ended. You can use whatever you want. Yeah. So for the login and the register uh, part, are we going to cover more about this function uh, for the following lecture? Yeah, we'll talk about more about logging in, although we did cover all the technology you need to do it, right? We covered the set session and set attribute, be able to store stuff in the session. We did talk about that already, but yeah, we'll cover that a little more detail. Okay, thank you. All right, folks, thank you. Thank you. Good night.